two or three players. You need two players to replace him, and you need another player to improve the squad we already have. We've got, and we've got Teddy Sheringham. In the last ten years, the history of United is fraught with with uh, small mindedness. I think in, in the boardroom. We're paying Tim Pot wages. They've got this whole thing. They say we're the biggest club in the world, yeah. But you go there and they're paying half the, half the wages that someone else who claims to be one of the biggest clubs right. is paying. You know, you go to Barcelona and you know you go to the biggest club in the world. You go to Old Trafford and you know we're the club that claims to be the biggest but doesn't have the ambition to be the biggest. We've got a lot to learn. We're, we're only, you know, the majority of the team are all young. Most of the team are all young. And, um, you know, we just want to carry on each season and try and do as well as we can. Very good. I mean, we've not played brilliant this season, but we've still won it by a mile, so it's a bit of a pathetic effort. Won, won it without kicking a ball. Well, exactly. I mean, we do it every year. Manchester United always were the most glamorous and popular British football club, but in the 90s they've become the most successful too. This medal-laden, multi-cap team, led by the last great manager of the old Scottish school, have now lifted nine major trophies in eight seasons. Before 1990, United was still the richest and best supported club in the land, but now they're utterly unchallenged. But the bedrock of the club remains the mission and spirit established by Matt Busby in the 40s and 50s, a legacy strong enough to survive the flames of disaster. And once more the Manchester defenders escape by the skin of their teeth. Time for United to apply the pressure. Preran spots that inside left Dennis Law is well placed. Just watch how that Scottish wonder turns the pass to complete advantage. The team built around the Holy Trinity bewitched a generation of supporters. My first home game, my first game, was uh, at home to Crystal Palace in October 1970, and we lost 1-0. Pathetic performance it was to a Bobby Tamling goal. Uh, it was Bobby Charlton's 400th game, if I remember rightly. Uh, and after that, I was hooked. I've met some great players, I've watched some great players, I don't think I would have had as good a last 30 years watching Arsenal regularly or Tottenham. I used to spend every penny on watching United, I used to hitchhike all over the country, um, played truant from school, got into trouble for it, absolutely obsessed I was. In the 120 years since we were founded, it has become our unique creed to do more than merely win. Tradition, largely fashioned by Samad, dictates that we do so in style. When they won the Dublin 94, it was superb. When they won the Dublin 96, it was crap. 
That's the worst. That's, that's the worst right. ever team that has won the double. Worst this season. The season's gone. No, that it was was the second double season. It's gone down. Look, look at the football like Newcastle were playing. Down. Look at the football Newcastle were playing. We're playing compared with the football United played when we won the double. Newcastle were brilliant to watch. Brilliant. Right. I only remember five or six games this season as reaching in what I would call the the heights of what we've got used to in the last five seasons. Most of those were away, Nottingham Forest, Leeds, Liverpool, um, Arsenal, and one or two at home, Sunderland. You'd be hard put to, to, to string a dozen great games last season. By the time we played Newcastle, we knew we'd won the league. And uh, the atmosphere there was just like any other game. And uh, I thought, well, you know, maybe it's because we're not being presented with the championship today. We'll get the championship the following game against West Ham, and it was just the same. There was no sense of uh, triumph really at all. Uh, it wasn't anything like it was back in 93 when we won the league for the first time, or in 94 when we won the double. Uh, and uh, I suppose if you've won the league four times out of five, it, it gets a bit like that. For all but a few of the last 40 seasons, Old Trafford's average attendances have been the highest in the land. We now boast a 55,000 capacity stadium, built almost entirely from the fans' pockets. Though ground development has sometimes seemed overcautious, tellingly, ticket demand still vastly exceeds supply. 40,000 season tickets and 182 executive boxes give United a head start of at least £18 million in revenue each August. In addition, their bars and restaurants take over a quarter of a million pounds every match. In reality, Manchester United can uh, can hold its head up high in, in Europe and indeed the world as, as amongst the most wealthy clubs in the, in the sport. How much are they? You can use many measures. The, uh, the company's value on the stock market is around £400 million, uh, certainly one measure. They've got over £70 million of assets, which is growing quite quickly on the balance sheet, which is another. And they've got, uh, they make millions of pounds of profits every year, which is a third. Uh, putting a clear figure on it is, is obviously difficult, but the simplest is to say, to buy them today would cost you £400 million. If they were actually in a takeover, it would cost you considerably more than that. They've got far more options financially than most clubs because of their size, because of their reputation and because of their financial strengths. Um, they can borrow money which would be pipe dreams for most other clubs in the UK. Watching United from an armchair has changed as much as spectating from a stand seat due to Sky TV. Successful clubs can pull in an extra 10 million from television, a figure due to increase explosively as new technologies arrive. United will benefit more than any other club. Now, the chairman and chief executive of News Corporation, Mr. Rupert Murdoch. If you look at, for instance, their turnover figure, uh, a good half of that is, is near as I admit, going straight to profit, uh, or at least it's a 100% contribution. By which I mean, if you look at TV revenue, sponsorship revenue, and gate receipts, if they get an extra pound in any one of those, if they got another million pounds from Sharps, they don't have to do anything different. If they get an extra two million pounds from television revenue, they don't have to do anything different. They're going to go out and play anyway. They've got those costs. Um, same with seats, although of course they can't sell any more seats, they've already filled the ground. So all those items are very, very high, what we call high margin revenue. Uh, and in that area, Manchester United lead not only uh, the country, but lead the world in, in those revenue streams. <laughs> The money men might complain that success can be expensive to achieve, but it should be worth the investment. Whilst they look forward to rising share values, the fans await the annual processions around town. If losing to the Dons last season forestalled a lucrative FA Cup run, an early Euro exit would have cost much more. Well, individual cup competitions, for instance, you can look at about a million and a half, maybe a bit more, if you win the FA Cup. Uh, similar sort of figures, a little bit less perhaps for the Coca-Cola Cup. Uh, the Champions League in Europe is where the real big money is, and estimates for winning the Champions League are somewhere around about eight and a half million pounds, and probably that's a little conservative uh, for winning the UEFA Cup or the Cup Winners' Cup. 
probably somewhere around about half that. So that's where, where some big money comes. Um, more reliably, it's money in the league. And if you win the league, uh, in the current year, oh, sorry, the season just starting, we'd anticipate uh, the winner there to get about seven, seven and a half million pounds from, uh, from revenues, be it TV and prize winners' funds. So all in, all in all, if you do the double, how much money do you get? The double of FA Cup and League is somewhere around about nine, nine million pounds, not including gate receipts, merchandise, spin-offs and so on. And, and if you win the European Cup? About nine million again. And uh, what about if you come second in the European Cup? Same again, nine million again, but you don't get automatic qualification for the next year. Right, so, so presumably, the more success you have as well, the, the, way, the, the players want a bit of the action as well, but as the shareholders. Oh, certainly, and uh, win bonuses are quite a significant feature. An interesting point uh, Michael uh, Edwards made the other day was uh, that if they got into the final of the Champions Cup, which obviously they didn't, they'd have been financially better off coming second than avoiding having to pay the win bonus. I'm sure he said it with his uh, tongue in cheek, but uh, financially he was quite right. Notoriously, United have maximised the merchandising opportunities offered by the team's success with Ruth Lucille, turning over £20 million a year. But contrary to media perception, matchgoers cared little about the so-called exploitation of the multi-kit 90s, instead recognising that such activities, however tacky, effectively subsidised ticket prices. <laughs> Ignorant media also often fail to put merchandising into proportion. The other area which gets an awful lot of comment is in their merchandise sales. People are fascinated by the 20, 30 million pound of revenue from that, that source. However, um, the profit on a shirt is nothing like the profit on a pound from television. So although it, it is a, a major source of, of income, um, its importance is probably more in terms of uh, opening the brand up, I um, mean you're talking about a brand with a club of its size, opening the brand up to more and more fans and we're seeing that it's expanding into the Far East, um, they're producing the Manchester United magazine now in, uh, in Thai uh, and we expect it to be produced in Japanese and various other languages before too long and it becomes a global brand and as television revenues grow and as pay per view becomes a, a global possibility so that will lead to greater television revenues. So it, merchandising is important, but it's nothing like as important as television revenues or sponsorship revenues. The fundamentals remain. Bums on seats are the prime revenue of a club, and always will be. Even if the future is to be dominated by a virtual crowd, sat at home with pay-per-view. We did a questionnaire at the end of last season, asking how much people have spent on average um, going to games, spending on food, tickets, and the average at the moment is, I think, £4,500, which is a phenomenal amount of money being spent by football supporters within our culture, and no fans... Each season. For e each season. Fanzines and independent supporters group exist primarily because United, like most other clubs, refuse to have a serious dialogue with their so-called customers. Star players can be sold without any credible explanation. Stadiums are organised without any proper account being taken of the wishes of those within. Consequently, major disputes regularly flare up inside Old Trafford, the latest resulting in fans being banned for life for trying to encourage a better atmosphere. The silent, well-heeled executive fans now dictate. This is the way it's going, everything's going to be more corporate, more organised, more executive and priced out. I, I think the average fan will be priced out, even at Old Trafford, and they've always been fairly fair over the years with their match price tickets. Those in Liverpool have always been 
um, they've kept them to a fairly good rate but now the average price is 18 I don't know what this season will be maybe 20 pound a ticket and um, how many people can afford that on a regular basis if they want to take their children slow motion lets us see it again perfectly in fact almost makes it look easy The club was once totally dominated by the presence of Matt Busby. It was he and assistant Jimmy Murphy who led United out of the war's ruins and took them to the top in the mid-50s. But from then on, Busby's United slowly slipped into the control of others, the Edwards family. The, 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 the really tragic tale really about United is the way in which Matt Busby brought Louis Edwards into the club because he wanted somebody with business experience who was a had got a certain status in, in Manchester and, and Edwards had. Uh, he was a well-known local butcher, although his methods were pretty corrupt and he got a lot of his contract through, frankly, through bribing local council officials to buy meat from him. But Busby brought Edwards into the club in, in 1958, just after Munich, um, to, uh, and, and, and envisaged that Edwards would uh, one day uh, become, become chairman of the club. What he hadn't realised was that um, Edwards would take over the club and ultimately exclude Busby and Busby's family from it. To ensure that Louis Edwards got the chairmanship, uh, Louis Edwards had to buy a majority of the, uh, of the shares. After all, uh, Matt Busby didn't decide who the chairman was. Um, the board uh, and, and the shareholders did. Uh, and it was only through having a majority of the shareholders that he could be certain, because the existing chairman, Harold Hardman, was by no means an admirer of Edwards, and indeed Hardman did his best to try and uh, get the job for, uh, or get the succession uh, for someone else. Uh, so the only way Edwards could be sure is by going around buying up shares. So what he did is he got a bloke called Frank Farrington, who was a real fixer figure involved in local government in Manchester, pretty corrupt character, who went round literally knocking on people's doors and saying, would you like to sell your shares in United? And most of these people were delighted they'd inherited them from people way back in the 20s and 30s. They'd no idea what the shares were worth. And here was the man turning up on the doorstep and offering them uh, you know, several hundred pounds for their shares. It was enough to pay for a holiday or, or a, you know, a new kitchen or whatever. And I calculate that he bought his majority shareholding in United for about somewhere between about 30 and 40,000 pounds. Round about the same time that United itself had bought Dennis Law for £115,000. In other words, Louis Edwards had bought a majority control of the club for a third the cost of the club's star player. An absolute bargain it was. And of course, um, in the last 20 years, it's reaped the Edwards family uh, an absolute fortune. After a rights issue, preceded by a shameful bout of insider dealing, Louis Edwards had secured both shareholding control and the vast profit. On Louis's death in 1980, Martin inherited the power and shares. His holding is now worth £75 million pounds, and he earns £6,000 a week basic. Uh, Martin Edwards worked in the um, family meat business. Uh, he wasn't very successful at school. As soon as he left school, he went to work in the family meat business. Um, I don't think that uh, if United were looking round for um, a good businessman to run the club, they would have chosen Martin Edwards. He's purely there uh, because he had a majority shareholding at one stage. And he was one of the first people to become a full-time chief executive in, um, in football, in a football club, uh, in the early 80s when that happened. That was pretty rare. In fact, it was unique in it was place uh, originally. Um, but I think that um, Edwards hasn't always run the club very well. And a lot of the business ventures that he ran in the 1980s, when he was running the club virtually on his own, uh, failed. It's only really when he's brought in other people, uh, Roland Smith, who's uh, the current chairman of the, of the public company, and uh, Robin Launders, who was the um, financial director who now works for Leeds United. It's only really when he brought in this outs outside expertise that United have really taken off as a business success.
As the brave new world of football developed after 1990, the era of the private club was over. The 90s demands, flotation on the stock exchange, the appointment of chief executives, and the modern capitalist lingo of director's service contracts and share option bonuses. Does it matter? Why, why are you a shareholder? I just wanted... It, it was a birthday present from my mum. She decided to buy me some. And I, it's, just, it's just a little bit of... A little bit to grab hold of, which, which is connected to Manchester United, really. I'm, I'm not in the business of moving them about and making money or nothing. If you had a choice between more profit on your shares or, or winning trophies, what would it win? Well, I'd take trophies, no doubt. Does anybody here not not believe that the PLC has been a problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah they're right around the I don't know if, club. if I, I can't see anybody but Ferguson uh, having done so well on, under the constraints he's, he's had to work under. And, and, and they are definitely, he's, he's carried them, he really has. They're, they're so lucky that, they, that they've come, come to be that's just great, just, just at the uh, at the interim period when he's been there four or five years, all the youth players are coming to fruition. All all his careful planning, it's all come, it's all all the jigsaw pieces are coming to place. Just the PLC have come on board and said, "Hey, let's make them loads of money." And they're like, "No, no, you can't buy him." United now are very different from the the standard, the norm of of football ownership. Uh, football club ownership. In the past what's happened is the local butcher or the local uh, undertaker or, or the local um, businessman has taken on board uh, the club and, and used it to project his ego. It's a public platform for his ego. I mean you see see that going on still with uh, Jack Walker at um, Blackburn or Sir John Hall at Newcastle. This is a platform and a place for them to say everything they want to say about themselves and their ambition. Martin Edwards has never really been like that. He's been interested in the, the money that's come out of the club, but he's not a man who's projecting his ego. Some might say he possibly hasn't got an ego worth projecting, but he's a man who's interested in, in the financial returns that the club could make. And so he went down the route of, of the public limited company. And of course, w once United became a PLC and they weren't driven by an ego, um, they, they changed the whole way in which they wanted to operate because now what they want to do is to have a long-term stable platform that is going to produce profits for the shareholders to uh, divvy up in the dividend. Coming to the market normally means that the club gets rid of debt um, which is a good thing obviously it enables them to buy players in the short term or perhaps expand the stadium or even move the stadium which is what's happened in several cases so there's a benefit there but uh, there's also a cost the club is run with an eye on the longer term more and perhaps less of a gambling instinct than, uh, than many fans would like. At the end of the day it's the, f it's the quality of football and the trophies one on the pitch that generates everything else behind it and it strikes that sometimes the PLC don't realise that. Yeah. They don't realise that three or four barren years and people in Japan aren't going to want to buy a Man United shirt if they're fourth or fifth in the league, never do anything in Europe. They want to, you know, they're going to want to buy a, a Newcastle shirt. Without a successful team, it all dies away. I mean, Manchester United will always be a big club, or at least as far as we can see into the future, even if they had a couple of bad years. Um, and you get other clubs such as Nottingham Forest who were very successful but were never big clubs. So Manchester United will always be big but they won't maintain these sort of levels of profitability and have the uh, financial acumen it has without a good team. So it, it really does come full circle. Without a good team, you're nothing. In the last ten years the history of United is fraught with with uh, small-mindedness I think in the boardroom I mean you know ten years ago uh, Martin Edwards tried to realize the asset that he'd inherited from his father by trying to sell it three times he tried to sell it I mean most noticeably to um, Robert Maxwell what a disaster that would have been uh, and then to Michael Knighton and it wasn't until uh, really the middle of the 90s that Edwards, who's always had a very expensive lifestyle he needs to maintain, realised that the best way of actually making money was to stay at United and make them a very successful club.
Millions spent over 25 years had failed to secure the title. Yet just £1 million in 1992 was enough to import championship winning genius from Leeds. But not even what Eric called a perfect marriage could escape the five year itch. United artist, philosopher, the greatest player of our generation, left on his trawler to resume his quest for fulfillment. It's a sad day for United. It's, he's been a fantastic player for his four and a half years in with us. And uh, we've won six trophies in that period. So obviously it's, it's um, a sad day. I think he was the catalyst that made us win all the uh, trophies we've won since. I think um, two things, Archie Knox leaving, Brian Kidd joining, well, being elevated up from the youth development office, officer role that he had at the time. Um, I think the combination of Fergie's determination, Brian Kidd, and the arrival of Eric Cantona, and it was just like the perfect motor that suddenly whirs into action. And I think, uh, I think that if we hadn't had Eric Cantona, we wouldn't have won all the the uh, Premier League titles and the doubles that we have done. Nobody in the history of English football has had a more successful football career than Eric Cantona. Uh, he's won five championships in just over five and a half years with Leeds and United. We saw a, a truly great player. But it was clear last season that he wasn't the player that he had been the season before or the one before that. He'd lost a bit of pace. He was still doing a lot. He was still creating a lot of goals and he was still scoring a lot of goals. But he was, he was starting to decline. Publicly, Cantona said he wanted to quit at the top. But naturally, fans had their own conspiracy theories. My view, because I read all the tabloids and pick up little bits of snippets like everybody else does, that maybe Eric was a bit annoyed that Brian McClear got a two-year contract and uh, he wasn't offered only the one-year extension or whatever. Um, one wouldn't like to think Eric was as petty as that, but th again, he's a very proud man. It is said that Cantona uh, grew um, impatient with the fact that uh, a big goal scorer wasn't being brought in uh, to play alongside him. Um, because apparently the club aren't prepared to pay the kind of monumental wages that these guys are getting in Italy. So the king now reigns elsewhere. His future stage more likely to be on a movie set than upon a stadium's turf. It feels like the end of an era, because it is. However well Teddy plays, those boots are unfillable. The Cantonistas paid their last respects at a testimony in Lille. Adieu, mon ami. winger to replace the Kinchelskis Gillespie golden days. <laughs> <laughs> People are offering six million for Cole and he paid seven million for him. He's not been they delivered the goods at Newcastle but he's not been delivering the goods here so they should sell him. If I was Alec and I'm sure this is what he will be thinking really, if he could find a you know a top class player wherever a top Central European defense player. or a striker. Well I, 
I don't know. I think I think I'm happy to go for a midfield player. You know, somebody who could conduct the band and help around Keane and Beckham. You know, to balance it up. You think a midfield player get in there, side then? I, I just think yeah, they've been leaking a lot of goals, haven't they? At they one have. or two stages during yeah. the season, and, yeah, and the in the European coming. games, they haven't scored the goals. Eric's great escape stunned the financial commandants in United PLC too, as their prize merchandise asset drops off the balance sheet. We want to do better in Europe. We've replaced Cantona with Sheringham, and it's, it's it's only negative, isn't it? We need if you get rid of Cantona, you need two or three players. You need two players to replace him, and you need another player to improve the squad we already have. And we've got. We've got There's so much kidology involved in in the football transfer business now, isn't there? I mean, you know, one week we're told that United aren't going to sign anybody, they're going to stick with the squad, um, and the next week they sign Teddy Sheringham. So you never quite know what's going on with football transfers these days. Which snatched a rival's major asset, cut price, much to their distress. But will the three and a half million pound deal look like such a Canton RS bargain this time next year? We were thought it was an unrealistic fee, and Alan Sugar came back two nights ago uh, with a renewed fee, and uh, spoke to Alec Ferguson, and immediately responded. And we, Teddy was away in Florida, so we had a little bit of difficulty. But we had to wait for him to come back, really, and it's all been done very, very quickly. I want to win things. Uh, any footballer, any young footballer coming into the game wants to win things, and. I'm 31 now, but I'm no different to anybody else, and that's what I, what I want to do while I'm here. Over the years, United have spent more on players than they've actually recouped, but they've often had unfortunate experiences with uh, expensive players. OK, some of them have worked out. I mean, Dennis Law, famously, Brian Robson, brilliantly, Mark Hughes, when he came back from uh, Barcelona, that, those were all great buys uh, and expensive buys. And, of course, Eric Cantona was a very cheap buy. Um, but, uh, I mean, often these expensive players uh, turn out to be a complete disaster. Uh, we've only got to think of uh, Gary Bertels, who went 30 games before uh, he scored a league goal. In fact, uh, there was always the joke about when the hostages were released from Iran, uh, and they came out and uh, one of them said, uh, tell me something, has uh, Gary Bertels scored for United yet? Uh, there was Terry Gibson, Alan Brazil. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, disastrous forwards over the years. <laughs> Having to let a player like Eric go prematurely is a managerial nightmare. Fans will hope a transition is rather more seamless than the succession to the treacherous Konchelskis, a player whose role still remains unfilled. Yeah, yeah OK, Andre, this way, please. <laughs> It took 10 years and three bids to capture Henning Berg, who must be pleased to see that the Department of Employment as bureaucratic as ever. I don't think Alex Ferguson's actually made too many bad buys in the transfer. I think he's done some quite skillful uh, wheeling and dealing. Um, Ron Johnson, I think, is a very good player, and, and Solskjaer. He signed, uh, I believe, an, a Norwegian, a, a lad of only 17 or 18 from Norway, unheard of. He'd been over here on trial, he'd scored a couple of hat-tricks and Ferguson signed him for, I don't know, it could probably be as little as £1 million. Well, if he's half as good as, as Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, he's got another bargain. I'm not sure about Paborski. I think I, I think he's he could, with a decent haircut, maybe get <laughs> get into the uh, Konchelskis role. He's, he's certainly got, uh, he's better at tackling and, uh, and, and better distribution at times. Um, I'm not too sure about Jordi Cruyff, although I think he's quite an intelligent footballer, but I think he needs to uh, toughen up mentally for the English league and, and uh, not be quite so precious. Pavorsky's problem is that he hasn't learned the language yet, uh, but he's getting there. And I think, I think once he does, once he relaxes, it's his first season, very tough season, but I think, I think he'll do well. Uh, he's, he's here for three, four years. I think, I think he'll do a damn good job for United. Cruyff, uh, possibly, uh, he, he might not stay. But uh, I think that's only because of the fact that he thinks that he should get first in football and when he's left on the bench he's not very happy. The cloud of the PLC's financial restraint which hangs over Alex Ferguson has one glittering silver lining of course. It has almost forced a reliance upon youth which has always been one of United's noblest traditions.
And it isn't just demographic luck that has gifted United such a batch of contemporary homegrown pros. It's the inevitable result of policy decisions taken by Fergie the moment he arrived back in 1986. From Busby's babes to Doherty's kids, and now to Fergie's fledglings. United have never deserved the accusation that they've simply bought success. I wish I was 22 and, you know, could play with these players for the next 10 years. We've got a lot to learn. We're, we're only... You know, the majority of the team are all young. Most of the team are all young. And, um, you know, we just want to carry on each season and try and do as well as we can. Salaries in excess of a million pounds a year, uh, 20,000 pounds a week, are not, not untoward, and he can afford to pay those if he needs to. So, so you're more or less saying that uh, Peter Schmeichel and Roy Keane could earn a million pound a year? Uh, players like that, David it, Beckham? It's, uh, uh, whether Beckham will yet, it's certainly possible that, that they could be on those sort of figures. Certainly a half a million pound a year, I'd say, quite conservatively. Uh, a good living. The failure to sign certain continental players because of their personal wage demands continues to fuel debate amongst fans. Should United maintain their strict wage structure and thus lose out on players, or risk both inflation and poor morale by shattering the pay ceilings imposed by the PLC? Keenan Cole would run about, you know what, doing 20, 20 grand, yeah. right? But uh, to bring someone like Janino in, if he's getting like a Ravinelli, whatever, if they're getting 42 grand a week at Middlesbrough, and it is a big jump, you know, probably, it's a big jump to simply pay somebody, you know, an extra 20,000. The reality is, that's the, that, that's the part they're playing in. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're not, you know, they're not trying, you know, they're not competing with, with Man City anymore, United, or, or Tranmere Rovers or Burnley or anything like that, yeah? They're, they're supposedly competing, wanting to compete on the pitch with AC Milan, yeah. with Barcelona, who will pull that money up. I, I, and we, I, I, you know, and if everyone else is doing it, you cannot book the system. Do you need is one exception to the rule where, where, they, where they could have looked and said, well, let's break the, let's break the pay structure, because I don't think anybody would question the commitment he showed for Middlesbrough last year. Oh, the other thing is, if you're a decent and footballer... What, what is Middlesbrough to a Brazilian? I know. What, it, it's nothing, and, and he showed so much commitment for a club like that. So, they should have brought the bank. If you're a young lad, yeah, and, you, and someone said to you, right, uh, we know you're only getting eight grand a week, yeah, we're going to bring this Ronaldo in, best, you know, recognised best football in the world, we're going to pay 50 grand a week. What do you mean, reaction? Well, that twat's getting 50 grand, you think. If, you had, if they had anything about you, you'd think, one half mind playing with him. Right, uh, yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? That should be the reaction. If there's yeah. players in your, you know, if they all, supposedly, all looked up to Canada. Well, that was the thing. Yeah, as a like genius, you know what I mean? And, and sort of like, you know, one of the great players, and I can learn off him. I win more trophies if guys like him are in my team. For their turnover, the amount yeah. of profit the United make, it's incredible. They could double like, the wage bill profit. and still be making huge About giving, money. giving the shareholders the right dividend at the end of the year. Yeah, and that, that's wrong. Pay the people away. Just get the top players in. If you're a European footballer, and like we like to see ourselves on like the European stage now, don't we, yeah? You might think there's, I don't know, a dozen teams in Europe who are like supposedly the class acts. You know, Barca, Real Madrid, Bayern Munich, Juventus, all that sort of thing, yeah? And, you, and you're tightening around, yeah? Man United has got this big publicity machine, calls itself the world's greatest football club. And you contact them. And you just think, well, they're paying Tim Pot wages. They've got this whole thing, they say we're the biggest club in the world, yeah? But you go there and they're paying half the, half the wages that someone else who claims to be one of the biggest clubs right. in the world is playing. You know, you go to Barcelona and you know you go to the biggest club in the world. You go to Old Trafford and you know the club that claims to be the biggest but doesn't have the ambition to be the biggest. United have never been a generous payer 
in the days of Matt Busby, his attitude was that you should uh, play for United with the glory of playing for the club. And people like Dennis Law and George Best were quite badly paid compared with other people, other players in the league at the time who weren't as good as them. But the attitude was that you played for the glory of playing for United. And that's carried on over the years. Uh, if you were to analyse the wages structure at Old Trafford, I'm sure you'd find that they're better paid at uh, places like Liverpool and Newcastle. He's, he's, he's built a great team, and then he's bad bad to a few people, and he's starting and he's brought the other players through, and he's done it again. I mean, what, what, how, how many other managers build, build great teams and then, and then start again? I think I think his man management is, is one of his one of his strong points. If you, if you look at two players so diversely different as Cantona and Giggs and the, and, the, and the two ways they handle the two players that they're so so different. When you look how he flew over to France when when after the ban when it looked like Cantona was going to Inter Milan and he talked him round and like when you look at Cantona's record in in the past and he, he was ne he was never happy and. He found his spirit at home at Old Trafford, and that, that had a lot to do with Ferguson, in my opinion. Yeah, there's, there's this thing about the siege mentality at Old Trafford and stuff, um, and, and he seems to have gotten so close with it because he, he knows, like we do, that everybody else is against us. The legendary temper and obsessional will of our manager came as no surprise to those who knew the player. His predecessor at Old Trafford, Ron Atkinson, was never as blasé as his media image suggested, but he was a pressurised manager in a hurry, buying a team of Cavalier stars, whilst perhaps neglecting the youthful foundations. I had bad luck and injuries, and he was faced with a recipe for failure. Thrilling cups were not enough to fill the titleless void. Ferguson promised round-headed rigour. I actually had no indication what was going to happen. I've come, I've come down today expecting uh, a nice five-a-side and what have you. And the chairman called for me at 10.30. They told me reluctantly, I felt reluctantly, that uh, they decided to dispense with my services uh, because of the results over the last few months. And, um, OK, I accept that totally. I haven't won the week for 20 years. Right, that is a great challenge for the Manchester United players and will be until it's achieved. A club of this size, one would expect that the platform, the stage, everything is geared to doing very, very well. And that very, very well means winning the league. He is the right man at the right place. What United needed when he arrived was a man of his energies to take on board the role. So many people who had taken the job before him were frightened of it and he came in and wasn't frightened of it and he determined that he was going to be in charge of everything and every aspect of the club it's to the club's great good fortune that someone like that came along and took them on board at a very low ebb in their history when discipline was falling apart when the youth system was on the rocks when the first team had no morale left it's very very important that a man of his strength and resolve came in and took over. A manager is seen as leader of his club, as a spokesman for its values. We are all Fergie's Renoir army after all. In dealing with the outside world, via the media, he acts like us fans, besieged yet unbowed. The way he handles himself in the media is very important in creating an image of the club which makes them a more powerful playing force. I mean, he used this when he was in Aberdeen, for instance. Um, he set up a challenge for the players at Aberdeen by saying that they had to break the uh, old firm domination. And he set up a challenge for the players at United that they had to break Liverpool's domination. And that the whole world is somehow against them is part of his motivational skill and the whole world is against United including the media so go out there lads and prove them wrong. Uh, Alex runs a very tight ship, uh, there are no leaks from the club, uh, the players, the younger players certainly, uh, 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 if you want to speak to them you have to ask for permission uh, but that's the way he runs it and that's that's obviously the guidelines that you have to stay within and, uh, uh, and uh, 
you know, you find out, you know, at your peril, if you if you cross those barriers, uh, you're going to get a, a verbal volley, volley from the manager. He isn't a man who needs the glare of publicity. He's not like, say, Big Ron or or um, Tommy Doherty or some of his predecessors who enjoyed the the rapport with the journalists and enjoyed feeding them little stories and enjoyed having a drink with them and so forth. He doesn't need them. He's got one or two friends in the uh, in the media, but basically. He's a guy who knows what he's doing, and he will give you the information you require and no more. He's not on friendly terms with you. So if you want to go beyond the information that he believes you require, he steps back a bit. As a fan of a club, I want that in a manager. I don't want my manager who goes around dropping indiscretions to the media, undermining his players with little stories that he places in the press. You don't want a manager like Graham Taylor, who was so determined to become friends with the media that he would actually sell out his players. Alex and I haven't really got on all that well, and I think that's a shame because I, I respect his passion for the game, and I respect his knowledge of the game, and I have enormous admiration for what he's done for Manchester United. But it does mean that I have to toe the party line, and if I think a player deserves criticism for the way he's played or the team hasn't played well, I'm going to say it. Um, and that doesn't go down well with Alex. So it's a sort of standoff between us. I mean, if he's any sense, frankly, he couldn't care less what I said. But by the same token, I don't, I don't really care what Alex thinks about me. I think we both approach our jobs in an honest way. It's unfortunate that we don't get on, because I still think deep down we've probably got a lot in common, but, you know, that's the way it is. He may not be the nicest man in football, but he's unquestionably the best manager, unquestionably. He's also, he's the last of an old breed, you know, he's the last of that Busby, um, Steen, Shankly breed of, of, of Scottish uh, working class socialists um, who, who worked, who did a proper job before they went into football. You know, you look around at these football managers these days, about Keegan Dalgleish, these millionaire dilettantes who can walk out on a job when the pressure becomes too much for them. Fergie would never do that, you know. Job is too important to him, it's there to be done. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> when you come from the background that he came from and work your way up like he did, you don't walk out on a job, it's it's far too valuable. He's the last of a, of a breed and, uh, you know, long may you reign, really. Even today, Fergie retained one characteristic habit, that of occasionally playing Tinkerbell with team selection. I think Fergie's weakness perhaps is in, in the area of tinkering with, with, uh, with sides. We've seen this quite a lot in the past when uh, inexplicable at least to the uh, lads on the terraces. Decisions have been made in selections of the team. You can look back to not playing Kanchelskis in the run into the 92 uh, league championship season, not playing Hughes out in Galatasaray, not playing Schmeichel out in Barcelona. These seem monumental mistakes. Think about the, the number of games we've, we've played in 94 with that, that double team, which almost won the treble. Yeah. Um, and, and like now, like you just said before, we don't play in the League Cup effectively. Yeah, we gave up, we've given it up. Haven't we? It's like, you, yeah. you know we're, we're going to play the, the weakest team we could possibly yeah. get away with, and, and I'm happy about that. Yeah. It's like we stood at Leicester that night. You're hoping it knocked out. And, and everyone's just like, looking at the watches and going, oh, it's alright, this was 2-0 down, there's no way we're going to get back. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it doesn't watch very well, he doesn't watch very well when we're complaining to the League that we're, we're having to play too many games, and then in the next breath, we're playing a three-tournament friendly in Thailand, for it, for example. Thai. Sunderland away. What does this phrase The worst Thai. performance, league performance of the season, possibly. What's the four days that? after leathering take, out six, four, take out six players in one hit. Yeah, just like, you know. Go for oh, it, uh, I just think I'll play, I don't know, somebody like Gary Walsh at Barcelona away, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Most important game of the thing. So, I don't know, I, I've got some good players there, which one should I drop? I know, I'll drop Schmeichel. <laughs> it's like, so Gibbs can play yeah. out, outfield. Yeah, you know, or I'll put in, you just wonder what, sometimes, he's a genius, but sometimes you just think, he goes home one night and says, oh, it's too f 
fucking easy for these United fans. They're winning too often, I know. <laughs> their heads up on Saturday. You cannot do that to a team. You can't take five or six players out in one hit and expect them to perform. You can take one or two out here and there and, it, and, it's got be, and it's got to be the right one or two as well. Yeah, it was a classic one uh, the year we lost the league in 92. QPR on, on New Year's Day. Yeah. When he played Mike Phelan on right wing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and he sat gigs on the bench. And, and Giggs was, was in absolutely top form yeah. at the time. And yeah. you just thought, why has why is he done that? There are many challenges to Fergie's domestic dominance, some much fated by the media. We're always happy with the new and trendy. But the Wengers and Hullets start the race under heavy handicap. Fergie benefits from a decade's experience of both title races and after suffering failure can inflict. And success has made his job safer than any contemporaries. If his will to win remains, he'll never surrender quietly. Well, the European Cup in two years, mate. Ever. Two years. Why do you think you can't transfer the dominance at home to Europe? Hey, we got in the semi final, but it's alright, isn't it? We'll win it next year again, easy. At the moment, we just cannot crack European teams' defences like we saw against Juventus and against Dortmund. We did it against Porto because we played open play like we do it on the domestic front, but in Europe, we just do not do that. There is a vivid link to our 68 European triumph. The assistant manager scored in that final. The European Cup is our holy grail and I, I, we've seen everything we were ever want and there is that desperation to re-step um, through 68 and to try, try and attempt uh, to regain what is considered a trophy, you know, it's so dear to United's heart. It was essential for me, two players short of a team that would have taken door. Yeah. A guy who could put the ball in the net and a, and a, and a very good, good central defender. Yeah, exactly. We've got the best goalkeeper in the well, world. Well, we've got a midfielder who can you know, operate pretty skillfully at the moment. You know, well, England's midfielder would appear to be at the moment, wouldn't it? Scholes and Beckham and all that. But we just, we, we're desperately in need of a guy who, when he gets in front of goal, can put the ball away. I agree with that. I agree with that. You know, and, and for all, you know, we had 28 shots against Dortmund. Mm -hmm. I agree with what you're saying. 28. Uh, at the other you know end I mean? of the pitch, but, but you, you compare that with Juventus, uh, uh, Juventus at home, where we had a lot of the ball, you know, and everyone's saying second half Juventus yet, we never actually troubled their goalkeeper. United only conceded four goals. Was it five? They conceded oh, five goals in ten games. Yeah. Two, two were deflections against Dortmund, one was a penalty against Juventus, one was a, one was a deflection against uh, oh, the, the, uh, Oh yeah, the only proper goal was Juventus' first goal. Was Juventus yeah. at, at, in Turin? I mean, when I was sitting in Turin, back in September and you know the scoreline was 1-0 but Juventus humiliated United they absolutely humiliated them and I thought then there's not the slightest chance of United winning the European Cup and not the slightest chance of them reaching the final and not much hope of them getting out of the group stages and it was only in the latter stages of the group that things began to turn a little bit I thought it was a soft group actually uh, I didn't think the other teams Juventus apart were that great but the performance against Porto really fooled me. I was expecting a great deal from them, and, and they, were, they were poor. They were poor in the night. And you have to say, I mean, United played really well, but I thought virtually everything went for them. It was one of those nights. And Alex has said that he wasn't expecting 4-0, and he knows that 4-0 was a mite flattering. When they go abroad, I think they do suffer from a, f a form of inferiority complex. I really do, and, and deservedly so in some cases, because um, even though we should have won easily in, uh, in Germany, on the other hand, they were still a very good team. And I think, I think United don't expect that when they do go abroad, you know. They have such adulation at home, I think when they get abroad they they can't quite hack, oh hey, these guys can actually pass the ball quite quickly and intelligently to each other. And then usually some of these teams like with Barcelona, they have somebody like Stoichkov or some Romario and that, and they can, whoosh, the ball's in the net. Clubs have now become European Champions League clubs. Juve certainly are a European Champions League club. 
Um, and what they do is uh, they get a squad together to win the cup and then the next year they get another squad together to win the cup I mean the extraordinary thing that would never have happened in England and would certainly I doubt would have happened at United was that when they picked up the cup um, two seasons ago uh, they had um, you know they, they then got rid of Ravinelli they got rid of Viali and brought in another stream of top players they're constantly scouring Europe for the top players specifically to win the European Cup you're competing against something very different then than even Liverpool than even Arsenal you're competing against the very best in the world I just think it's down to better players and I, 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 I have enormous admiration for Schmeichel. He's, got, he's very lippy, but he's a fantastic goalkeeper. Um, they desperately need a fit Pallister, and Gary Pallister always seems to me to be carrying this back injury. I mean, it just lingers. Uh, May's come on a treat, absolute treat. I'm very glad for him because he's a nice guy. And when Keane and Butt are, are together in the midfield, well, it's very strong. Up front, well, Solskjaer has been a bonus. I'm still not a fan of Annie Cole, sorry, I know he had an exceptional game at Highbury in the league, but that's one good game in how many bad ones. I don't, I don't rate Andy Cole, I'm sorry, he certainly wasn't worth seven million quid. The problem is, I think, as they showed against Dortmund, where they had all that possession, unless you've got an absolutely top-class goal scorer, um, you're not going to do it. And I personally, if I was in charge of the club, would sanction getting Alan Boxick or Ronaldo or someone like that in just to fire the bullets that Beckham and Giggs and, and Keane uh, are, are moulding. And I just take the punt that it's worth paying him and all the other players won't mind because he'll be worth uh, the money if he brings them the European Cup. Um, carry on. I mean, um, you know, once you get a taste of success, you want more of it. So hopefully, we can win, win some more. on the club just appreciate that little bit more what what it's like to be a United fan and what we feel like and how um, how obsessed we are about the team that we're not all this you know we're not a bunch of people who who just go in and leave we're seven days a week United fans and all we want is the best the future context of United's existence is uncertain as talk of a European Super League continues. For now, domestic football still dominates. But is a time coming when our main rivals really will be Juve and Barca instead of Liverpool and Leeds? I'm a bit alarmed about what's going on at Arsenal at the moment. I think uh, Arsene Wenger is a man uh, to be reckoned with. Uh, I think that Ferguson's outburst against him at the end of last season was 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 the outburst of someone who's who's slightly worried. I think there may be a renaissance in Arsenal in the next couple of years uh, to match them domestically. Liverpool possibly, but they've still got this playboy core, which is always going to hold them back, I think, at the moment. Um, so domestically United were always going to dominate and certainly dominate for the for the five five years or so that uh, the present crop of, crop of players are going to be around the big question is Europe I mean they got to the semi-final this year perhaps they'll go one better next year will they win it? well they need a monumental stroke of luck and in my opinion they need a they need a a continental finisher
The future also offers United's armchair brigades for chance of pay-per-view TV, which will at least treble United's profitability. But will we continue to be the same club once potential predators have calculated the figures for themselves? In the short term, by which I mean the next two to three years, it's going to be the advent of pay TV, uh, pay-per-view TV rather, and that could bring, bring in some quite significant sums. Probably not the really big sums which some people are talking about, at least we don't believe, until at least 2001. Uh, but you can see 5, 10, 15 million a year of, of income coming in from that. And it's got to be remembered that as with all TV income, that's near enough pure profit. So that's the short term. That will help them move forward again relative to their peers. Longer term is the question of this European Super League. And if that is formed, which again we believe it will be, if only so that you can have a league where financial equals are playing each other, or nearer financial equals than will be the case in domestic leagues throughout Europe, then that would be another, st another step jump again. But that's probably five years away. Whether Manchester United will or not, I'm not sure, but I certainly anticipate football clubs being taken over. Um, it seems an almost obvious move that media companies would want to take over football clubs. Um, football is amongst the most attractive media assets there is in the world nowadays. And you're seeing it in America with uh, the baseball and so on, clubs being owned by media companies and media uh, moguls. And Granada have been mentioned in connection with Manchester United, and there's an awful lot of logic between Granada owning Manchester United. Uh, whether it actually happens is another matter, but it, it wouldn't be surprising. So, will the dispossessed and marginalised hardcore United fans ever surrender? We don't care how well our biggest rivals, i.e. Liverpool, City, Leeds, everyone else can f*** off. <laughs> we, don't, we don't care. We will support United. We have not got the money to support them. And, and we are fast running out of finances as they bring in the outside influences and these f***ing corporate f***ers who want a f***ing family ticket and the boxes. And, and we, we don't care. And we will be there every year irrespective, whatever, we will do what we have to do to raise the money for that season ticket and we will be there whether they win f all, whether they win the European Cup, the World Championship, we will be there, we will be there. It's glory and honour the great man, he said there's nothing on earth like being a red.